cover today. Um, so we are covering the other 361.5B bypass provision. Um, some of these are used a lot more than others. Um, a lot of these slides you'll see bypass provisions that you've never had used in your cases. Um, so some of them we'll spend a little bit more time on than others, but of course if you have any questions, um, feel free to ask us um, during our presentation. Alright, so some general rules. Most of these you guys should know since you guys were all at the mandatory training last week. Uh, but the burden of proof, no, it's clear and convincing evidence. It's much higher than just a preponderance. And you are entitled to a continuance of disposition if you have been noticed of a bypass recommendation up to 30 days. However, as we know, some courtrooms do not give you 30 days. Sometimes they give you one day. So be prepared at the outset of your case. Again, you are entitled to notice. So the department does have to notice you of a bypass recommendation. If they do not notice you, then that is an appealable issue. So be careful about notice. Also, early on in the case, advise your clients early on about doing programs, about visiting early and often. Uh, try to get that bond and hopefully an acceptance if the bypass does apply going forward. Okay, so the first bypass provision we're going to cover is the 361.5B1 bypass for whereabouts unknown parents. Okay, so basically if the client um, can't be found, then the court won't give them reunification services. However, there is an exception. If they show up any time in the six months following disposition, then the social worker is required to provide them um, with a case plan and give them reunification services. So most people see this in about two different scenarios. Either you get a regular pickup at detention and for some reason or another your client disappears in between detention and jurisdiction. Um, now, when that happens, it's important that the department has a completed due diligence. Um, if it's not complete, if something is still pending, if an address hasn't been um, explored, if a number hasn't been called, of course, object. Um, the other scenario it comes up in, um, and I think people see this more commonly, is when a whereabouts and known client shows up post disposition. Um, for those cases, it's important to, of course, um, always do an Ainsley review. And if you see that the due diligence wasn't complete, um, file a 38, file an Ainsley, because if you don't bring up this issue, then it's waived. Um, the other unique thing about this hearing is that generally, um, a 2-6 shouldn't be set. Now, what I advise people to ask for is a six-month 2-1-E um, review hearing um, after disposition, because like I mentioned before, the whereabouts and known client, if they show up in between um, disposition and this six-month review hearing, they are entitled to reunification services. Um, there used to be a rule of court that required this uh, six-month review hearing to be set. That's not the rule anymore. However, um, under the California Rule of Court and 361.5 um, F, you, a 2-6 still can't automatically be set if your client is bypassed under the B-1 provision. So um, again, generally ask for a six-month review hearing to be set. Oh, um, one other thing I want to mention. <clears throat> there is a case, in Ray Jonathan D., it's a 2014 case, that seems to imply that DCFS has um, a continuing duty to follow up with your client if they receive any new information um, as to how to contact them. So in that case, the social worker got a new phone number from the, the child in the case, and the court kind of reprimanded them for dragging their feet in not contacting this parent and asking if they wanted reunification services. So that's just another thing that you guys should look out for. Okay. Okay. Are they supposed to walk it into court so that the person can have an attorney appointed? Um, I think they should. Generally, the case law says that it is the social worker's responsibility to bring it to the attention of the court when a parent um, wants reunification services. Um, what I've seen more commonly, though, is um, a case coming in at the 2-1-E, and there's information about the... Um, the parent being in communication with the social worker and then the parent shows up in that way. But I, I would ask the, the social workers to walk it on. I mean, I think that would be best practice. Really. So the 2-6 is not supposed to be set. Um, should it be, is it, did you say it's supposed to be an RPI? 
Um, I've had it called like a six month 2 one e review hearing. Oh, um, but even, so it's a 2 one e even if no parent is getting SR? Yes. So I, there are a number of ways I think other people have proposed how to do it. Um, some people suggest setting a 2-6 just six months right. out um, instead. I, in my opinion, I've just found it easier just to ask for that six month review hearing because the parent can show up any time and just saves the court the trouble of having to take the 2 months calendar um, and doing all of that. But um, I've seen it both ways. I think as long as the 2-6 isn't set 120 days later, then you should be fine. Brenda, yeah. does the parent need to show up at that next hearing once they become more about snow for the reunification services? I haven't seen anything saying that it's required. I mean, I think they should, because if they, if they don't show up, they don't get an attorney. I mean, there's not there's not really much we can do if the parent doesn't show up. Right. Um, if we're not on the case already. Um, well, I mean, just hypothetically, if a parent shows up at a 2-1-F state, if he became whereabouts known during the first six months, during the 2-1-E period, and shows up and says, well, they never did anything for me as far as getting me reunification services, I mean, we have a remedy at that point. We're already at the 2-1-F, I realize, so we're probably out of time, um, even if the child is over three. Uh, but, the, I mean, yeah, I mean, do we have any remedy if he shows up that late, saying, I had contact with the social workers during the first six months? But, but they never get, I mean, I would, I would bring it up to the court, and I would ask, I mean, first you check notice, obviously. And if they were actually not whereabouts unknown, due diligence wasn't complete, then that's a reason to go back to this level. Um, but I mean, I I think generally you can just let the court know that they were entitled to reunification services. This is probably more like a reunification services issue um, because they were entitled to reunification services. They showed up in the six months. They didn't get it. Um, and is this somebody that was it presumably TFR at the six month hearing? I mean, he wouldn't have been TFR because he never got reunified. So nothing would have happened. Right. So, so it just would have been a wrongful bypass. Yeah, I mean, let's just say hypothetically he shows up at the two and F having never received reunification services. His attorney had to make a special appearance during the two and F because he had to check for any potentially issues. The two and F findings were made as to the mother. And I mean, and, but otherwise, notice is proper for the adjudication, so there's no injury issue. Um, I just was wondering if that parent would have any recourse I mean, because they never got adjudication. Okay. I mean, I generally, I think it is something that you should bring up to the court, and I don't know exactly how you would frame it. I think maybe a reasonable services issue might be part of it. Okay. So the next. Bypass is B2, um, the mental disability uh, bypass provision. Now, this one I don't, I haven't seen very often, and I think the reason is because it's a very difficult bypass provision to do. Um, so it requires first that the parent be found to be suffering from a mental disability, um, and also that there is evidence that even with services, they're not going to be able to reunify with their children. Um, so, in order to prove this, you need evidence from experts who need to have very specific qualifications. Um, so either a physician or a surgeon, um, certified by the American Board of Psychi Psychiatry, or a licensed psychologist. Um, so there are a few things to look out for in this. Um, generally, if the court is thinking about ordering an evaluation, object. <coughs> always, always object. There is nothing good that can come of the court ordering um, an evaluation for this purpose other than your client being bypassed. If the court does order an evaluation, um, ask that the expert also focus on specific programs that they believe the client can benefit from it from. Because if it's it's if it's a more narrowly tailored um, evaluation, then it, that could possibly help your client. Um, the other thing to look out for is the qualifications of the experts. Now again, this <coughs> bypass provision requires very, very specific qualifications. Um, so it's important that if the expert you notice doesn't have these qualifications, 
that you object. And it's not just a regular objection during argument. Uh, you guys have to make an evidentiary objection. So if the reports contain any statements um, by these experts, um, object to that being entered into evidence. Um, another thing that um, you should be aware of is that if your client doesn't comply with getting the evaluation, if the evaluation is ordered by the court, um, they can still be by the court. So um, if, if it is ordered, they have to do it. Um, and another thing to be uh, aware of is that there is no best interest exception here. So if this bypass provision is found to apply, then, then that's it. Um, there's not really much else that your client can do. Um, one other thing that I wanted to mention is that there is currently a conflict um, in case law as to whether or not the experts need to agree. Um, so it's important to look at the facts in your case. Um, there has been case law where it says that um, the experts don't have to agree for the court to still bypass the provision as to whether or not the parents need to are able to utilize services. Um, in that case, both of the experts said that the father in that case suffered from um, psychological issues that would make it really hard for him to reunify. Um, so they both said very bad things about the client. In the case where they said they do have to agree, they disagreed as to whether or not the client even had um, a mental disability. So there, there are two pretty distinguishable cases, so just keep that in mind in case um, you have this bypass provision come up. Um, the next one is uh, before the death of a child, um, you're basically put on notice of this bypass provision becoming applicable um, anytime you have an F case. Um, so the bypass provision says that um, a parent is eligible for this if they've caused the death of another child through abuse or neglect. Now, the Court of Appeal has defined neglect very broadly. Um, it doesn't need to be criminal negligence. Um, it's just, um, it just needs to be a substantial factor in the death of a child. Uh, they've utilized the but-for test um, in determining whether a parent caused the death of a child. Um, they've used just uh, an ordinary breach of care and ordinary negligence standard. Um, and it also doesn't need to be your child. Um, that has died or that you are responsible for the death for. There was a case, um, Medardo v. Superior Court. Um, in that case, the father was 15 years old. When he was 15 years old, um, he raped and murdered a 13 year old. And the court found that that was enough um, to bypass him for. Um, in that case, though, the Court of Appeal does take pains to distinguish that case um, where it was a pretty um, brutal and violent crime from cases where it's uh, tragic horse play between children. So if you have a case like that, um, again, it's important to read that case and distinguish your case from that one. Because in that case as well, the father still had um, continuing criminal activity, domestic violence. It just wasn't a good uh, look for him. Um, does this include like a baby that dies from SIDS? Or like from close sleeping? Okay, the question is if this includes babies that died from SIDS or close sleeping. Um, I have seen a few cases um, from the Court of Appeal where they have uh, bypassed for close sleeping. Um, now, one of the big ones is uh, the death from close sleeping also had to do with the parents' drug use, but the court actually mentioned that even without the drug use, they, they, they still think. Um, they would be eligible for this bypass provision. So it's again, it's, it's pretty broad. Yeah. Um, now, just, we're going to get to best interest later, but one thing that I did want to point out is that um, it's going to be incredibly hard to show best interest for these cases. Um, generally, the Court of Appeal um, disfavors granting reunification services uh, for parents in these cases. It's not to say that all hope is lost, but it just means that you're going to have to um, work extra hard on these cases, and you're going to have to prep your clients and encourage your clients to um, do amazing um, before the disposition comes in. So B5, B5 has to deal with e-allegation cases. Um, basically, if the child was brought within the jurisdiction of the court um, due to a subdivision E, section 300, finding that based off the conduct of the parent or guardian. 
Um, this is a situation, though, remember that the allegations are child-specific to the injured child, and as such, the bypass would only apply to that specific child. However, um, as you learned from last week, there is also the B7 that can get your client bypassed as well, and also the B6, which is, I will get into soon, about severe physical harm to a child. Uh, I would suggest that you guys also read KF v. Superior Court. This is a case that talks about that the e-bypass also has to be at a clear and convincing level. The government in that case actually made a um, plain reading of the statute to say that as long as an E was sustained, the court, uh, the trial court could potentially just look at the minute order and find that it was sustained at a clear and convincing level just because they looked at the <coughs> minute order and acknowledged that they did sustain the E. The appellate court did not find that to be good reasoning because it goes against all the principles as to why the bypasses exist and the burdens of proof at a clear and convincing level. Um, KF, the Superior Court, also had a reading at the trial court level where the court said in its finding it could only find the E true on a preponderance standard. And so because of that, the, the appellate court said there is no evidence beyond that showing that it could be, it could be found true at a clear and convincing level, and at, as such, it remanded to offer FR off that basis. However, there was also a B6 allegation that was also based off of the B5, uh, sorry, the B6 was also found to be true, which also resulted in a bypass, but because the B6 was based off of the E allegation being found at a preponderance level, the B6 also went away as moved. Okay. Also, I want to point out that it requires the conduct of that parent. However, the conduct of that parent has does not only include the perpetrator who committed the the abuse that resulted in the E allegation, it also includes the actions by a parent who knew or should have known. You then turn to LZ v. Superior Court. This is a pretty interesting read if you kind of want to nerd out. Um, it talks about the res ipsa standard being the possible, in that a parent could potentially have an E allegation sustained against them if they were the primary caregiver of the child and they were in the home um, where the child was injured. Even so they use a res ipsa to say because you live there and you were the primary caregiver, um, there's enough evidence to say that you committed the E allegation or at least you knew of it or should have known about it. But in LZ, they said that there's a difference between clear and convincing level for the bypass versus finding it true jurisdiction. Um, and LZ is actually even more interesting because based off my reading, it kind of seemed like the, it was based off a 17-year-old mom who was a bit of a drunk. The child got injured that we all believe it's under the care of the father. The child was in the room with the father alone. She heard the baby screaming wildly. The father had just gone into an argument with her, so there was some concerns with domestic violence as well. And when the father comes out with the baby, the baby no longer uses its left arm. Um, she eventually brings the child to the doctor, and they find out that the child had also some rib injuries, so they filed the E allegation. <coughs> Um, but mom was very sympathetic. She started testing very clean. She started visiting regularly. Um, the minor's counsel, who was a minor's counsel, you might all like know, a minor's counsel who was always against a parent, actually made this long, profound plea to the court to give these parents reunification services, especially the mother. And so I found that even though I thought she likely should have known or knew, um, the appellate court did not because I think she was a very sympathetic client. So that's a good reminder to all of you. Get your client to be very sympathetic, so and it could sway some people's minds. So this is a special bypass because it doesn't have the regular best interest exception. Instead, it has a higher level. It's in 361.5 C3. Um, it requires the court to find, by competent testimony, that services are likely to prevent reabuse or continue neglect of the child or that failure to try reunification services would be detrimental to the child because of the bond between that child and the parent. Um, so breaking that, that into those factors, you first look at what is competent testimony. Um, that leads you to INRE AM. INRE AM is an interesting read as well because it was actually a 388 followed by the mother after she was already bypassed under the B5. And in that, the attorney went under a regular 388 best interest standard. Um, however, the appellate court basically said that you need to find the best interest at a clear and convincing level, but beyond that, that because of the fact that you filed a 388, that does not exclude you from ha 
actually having to make the also finding the also required findings under 361.5 C3 that there was competent testimony that would and that the services would prevent reabuse and neglect or that there was such a bond. So because of that, the trial attorney did not realize he had to meet also the standards of 361.5 C3 and had his client testify about their progress and about the best interest of the child, but not specifically as to whether or not the services would prevent reabuse or neglect in the future. And as such, uh, the court did not find her comp testimony competent. Um, so while one might read it that a parent's own testimony would not be competent, instead I read it as because the mother's testimony wasn't specific to the actual bypass provisions and the requirements to be made to make a finding of services, that's why the court did not find it competent. So understand that 388s after the fact of being bypassed by a B5 have different standards than a regular, B, uh, regular 388. Uh, if you want to look at some of the factors that the court does consider, I would you should read 361.5 C4. It kind of does like an outline that people usually do in terms of a best interest analysis, in terms of what happened during the incident, um, whether or not the person who just failed to protect the child is still living with the perpetrator, um, whether or not they're already in services, um, whether or not there's competent testimony about uh, reunification services or the bond between the child and the parent. Um, and remember that DCFS has a burden to actually tell the court in its assessment whether or not services would be, uh, would be effective in preventing re-abuse or neglect. Um, in, in Ray Rebecca R, essentially they found that the social worker failed to actually tell the court whether or not services would be effective, and as such the court remanded to give services. Um, however, there was a later case that uh, basically said that that burden on the department is actually a very low threshold. They don't have to make a big analysis as to whether or not services would be effective. They just have to give their opinion. So basically two sentences could be sufficient for that court. Do you have a question? Yeah, I was curious. Would competent testimony um, require the testifying or a witness or an expert witness to get and testify? Or would a social worker that says, yeah, this would work be considered competent testimony? Uh, so the question was whether or not competent testimony required some sort of expert or the social worker. From what my firm has done research on for competent testimony, we really couldn't find anything as to what competent testimony meant. Um, but from my reading, it just seems that any testimony that is competent to, on the exact point of what you need to find. Um, so in In Re AM, because the mother did not address the specific findings the court needed to make, it did not find her testimony competent. So the next one we were going to go over is related. It's the severe physical or sexual abuse of the child. Um, this is a situation which will likely be tagged along with an e-allegation because of the if there's a sibling um, or even the child itself could actually have its own uh, B6 provision. It's where and it has two different uh, code sections. You have to understand the 361.5 B6B and 361.5 B6C. Um, each one gives a definition of what is consider considered severe sexual abuse and what is considered severe physical harm, uh, respectively. And it's important to know for Tyrone W, uh, that's a case that you guys probably want to know because it's beneficial for us of all the cases we've read. Um, it talks about mere negligence is not sufficient in order to um, find the bypass to be true. Uh, there is Essentially, it's a no should have known standard. Okay. Um, in Tyrone W, it was a case in which there was a mother and a father. Um, the father was claiming that he was not aware of the abuse that was happening to his child. and uh, But the trial court was talking about how he should have known. Um, however, there was also no other indications that the child, child was being harmed. And it was clear that he wasn't aware that the mother was engaging in any abuse to his child. Um, in Tyrone W, the reasoning being is that they did a plain reading of the statute. And they noted that um, 361.5 B6 uh, does not include the terms deliberate and inflicted, but omits the, the statement reasonably should have known. So because of that, the client either had to have known about the abuse no, or known about the injuries happening. There is no should have known standard that would apply. Right? Um, that being said, a lot of the other cases are very bad for us. Uh, for example, uh, a parent's omissions can result in them being considered complicit. Uh, that would be Amber K, the Superior Court. This was a kind of a messed up case where the mom had custody of her children 
Um, eight years prior, the father had sexually abused one of the children um, 18 times, and each time that child told the mother about the sexual abuse, uh, and law enforcement reports were even made. Um, however, she continued to allow him to have contact with the children. Years later, there was another case, and it's found out that the father had an overnight visit in the home where he abused another child. And based off of that, um, also that child also told the mom, and the mom did not kick the father out. She just allowed him to stay in the home. Um, so it was pretty egregious acts, such that the court found that because she knew it was happening, it allowed him to continue to have contact and did nothing to stop it. Um, she was essentially complicit in the sexual abuse of her own child. On terms of the severe physical harm cases, um, there's also acts of omission can result in uh, a child being severely physical harm, uh, severe physical harm to a child. You should, guys should read Pablo S. Pablo S. is also a pretty messed up case where a six-year-old fell off a scooter and broke his femur. Um, the child was unable to walk on that leg and the parents failed to give him any uh, medical treatment for two months. During those two month period, the child had to drag himself around the house or hop on one leg. He would cry every other day to the point where the neighbor heard what was going on. Eventually, um, the parents tried to give him like ointments and ice, ice on his leg and they told him to suck it up. They thought he just pulled a muscle. We also find out that the mother called the hospital and found out it was a $50 copay and it was too expensive for her. <laughs> she also called a free clinic about getting medical treatment, but she never followed up on that medical treatment. So it's pretty messed up. His leg also did not heal properly. It healed shorter, and he could no longer bear weight on that leg. So the appellate court found, and it was actually interesting because they had done services, they were in therapy, and the therapist actually said that the parents could reunify and could do good things um, later on because they were complicit, uh, compliant with their services. However, the appellate court and the trial court even um, acknowledged that what they did was so serious. Um, essentially, they uh, I'm sorry. Um, they basically, because of the fact that they knew about the child's injury, they did nothing about it for two months. The fact that the neighbor who heard the crying eventually said, "Hey, I'll go take this kid to the doctor for you guys," because I don't know why you guys aren't doing it. Um, it was so severe that the act or the act of not acting could be sufficient to find severe physical harm to a child. Likewise, you could also turn to Jose O, which is another messed up case. If anyone's ever watched the movie Dexter, it's kind of like Dexter's background story. Um, this is a case where the father stabbed the mother to death in front of the child. Um, and the parents were covered in blood when law enforcement came. The child acknowledged what happened to his own mother. He said, uh, Daddy, kill, uh, Daddy killed mommy. Um, and the child was very afraid and very upset. The court found that the actions were, were so traumatic to that child that it amounted to torture. Um, and they did an acknowledgement that it does not require you to physically harm the child, but the harm itself could be caused by severe emotional harm. So there are multiple ways that your the client, the child can receive severe physical harm besides the normal thought process of you hitting a child. But the good thing about 361.5b6 is that it is actually harder to prove because the department also has to prove an additional item that the uh, that services would not benefit the child, right? So that reunification services would not be beneficial to a child. It's really hard to say that reunification services for anyone would be harmful to a child, right? Uh, so what they look at is 361.5i, and we turn to that section, um, which talks about what information the court should be considering. The biggest thing is obviously the bond between the child and uh, uh, the parents, whether or not the child also wants to reunify, and I would say our usual idea is like a 12-year-old who can object to TPR would probably be given more weight into their credibility, and also a 10-year-old would also be, I think, considered to be more credible because it's talked about later on um, in other code sections that a 10 year old should have a voice in whether or not they should reunify with their parent. The act itself again is also going to be a big factor so it is kind of a totality of the circumstances kind of situation but also the well-being of the child and how that child's behavior has been going on throughout the case. Um, this also has a Rebecca R kind of situation in which the department does have to state 
a basis, or the court actually has to state a basis by which the services would not be beneficial to the child. So it's a higher burden of proof for the department to prove, and I, that's why I don't think you see it as often. However, it clearly can apply more often than not. Okay, um, moving on to B8. Um, this is a pretty straightforward bypass provision. Um, if the child was conceived by um, an offense listed in 288 or 288.5 of the penal code, they can be bypassed. Basically, if, uh, the, if one of the parents is, was under the age of 14 when the child was conceived, um, then that's something that they can get bypassed for. So obviously, if you see a case where one parent is 30 and the other one's 13, then you know you're going to have a problem. So the code indicates in the Family Law Court code that if a baby is conceived through rape, the <coughs> semen provider is not a father. So how do we get to this point, having found someone a father, if there's been a conviction for rape? So what it says is that I don't think it necessarily requires a conviction. Um, the, the bypass provision doesn't specifically say conviction. I think maybe it says like the elements of the crime, meaning that one of the persons is under the age of 14. Um, I, I've seen cases where there was a minor parent um, and there hasn't <coughs> been any um, problem with the court finding them presumed. Um, I, I think maybe this may come up in cases where uh, the parents are a little bit um, more closer in age. Um, but again, I, I can't really go into too much detail about this because it doesn't seem like this is something that is commonly used. Um, there, I didn't find any case law about this specific bypass provision. Um, it is just something that I do want people uh, to be aware of. So um, a product of rape uh, can be bypassed, but um, that might also be another reason why fathers are bypassed. I mean, if they're not um, a presumed father, then they're not necessarily entitled to reunification services. I'm sorry, what? Um, I, my reading of it, um, I don't think there needs to be a rape conviction, um, just that if it could qualify um, under 288 or 288.5, um, because it mentions things outside of the state that would also constitute falling under this crime. Um, would would be you would be eligible for bypass as well. Um, again, I can't say definitively though. I mean, there is no case law. I um, if you have this case come up, um, that's something that you could use. You could argue that there was no conviction for this. Um, so you you I think you have a lot of leeway with some of these these bypass provisions where there isn't really um, clear guiding case law. So use the use that to your advantage and and use the, your own reading of the the statute to you. Uh, next is the B9 um, bypass provision um, for abandoned children. Now, there are two different ways that you can come under this bypass provision. Uh, first, a safe surrender baby. So um, I think everybody here knows the safe surrender um, laws. Within 72 hours of a child being born, you could drop it off at um, uh, the fire department hospital. Um, so if your client falls under that, um, if they surrendered their baby, then they can be bypassed under this provision. Um, there are other ways, though, for safe surrender babies, um, for parents to try to get them back. So I, I would encourage everybody, if you have a case, to look at that um, the health and safety code. Uh, it's 1255.7, so in case you have a, a case like that. Um, the more common way is through G cases. So it's not just that the client has um, been found to fall under 300G but also that uh, the parent willfully abandoned their child and the abandonment constituted a serious danger. Um, now, I wasn't able to find any published case law on this, um, which, again, I think we can use to our advantage, because the cases I did find did construe um, willful abandonment um, pretty loosely. They were, they were really harsh um, to some of these parents. They found that uh, a deported parent, for example, were willfully abandoned um, their child despite the fact that they tried to get back into the country. Um, so the unpublished cases are really harsh, um, but again, this is they're not published, they're not law, 
So I would encourage everybody to go by the plain reading of the statute because it does say that willful abandonment um, shall not be construed as actions taken in good faith by the parent without the intent of placing the child in serious danger. So I would focus on that sentence if you ever have a case that you need to argue before the court because I, I think you'll rarely have a situation where a parent has the intent of placing their child in serious danger. Um, this is just, I just put up some um, examples of unpublished cases so you know um, what potentially to look out for. Um, but again, argue the language of the statute because that will really work um, to your advantage. Okay, B12, violent felonies. Um, so this is one of my least favorite um, bypass provisions because it is so, so broad. Um, I encourage everybody to look at 667.5 of the Penal Code because it is a very, very broad list of crimes. Okay, so um, robbery, carjacking, arson, um, kidnapping, there, there are a lot of different convictions that could qualify your client to be bypassed under this provision. Um, so if you have um, this provision come up, again, look at the penal code. Um, usually you'll get tipped off to this pretty early on because a lot of times when, uh, when clients have pretty um, serious criminal convictions, the department includes it in an allegation. So that'll be your first clue. Um, it's also paired a lot with the E1 um, bypass provision, which I'm going to talk about um, uh, towards the end of this presentation. But um, again, so it is something that um, you're going to know pretty early on applies. There's no nexus required between the crime that they were convicted for and any risk of harm to the kids. Um, so again, it's, it's something that you can use to argue for best interest, of course but it's not going to necessarily stop a client from qualifying under this bypass provision. Um, so they can have a conviction from years and years and years ago, 30 years ago, um, and it, they can still qualify under this bypass. Um, of, another, all, of all 50 states <laughs> and uh, the D District of Columbia and Puerto Rico, <laughs> who has the most restrictive violent felony statute. California. More more restrictive than Kansas? More restrictive than Kansas. <laughs> um, so yeah. Someone so should Cali do something about that. Yeah. We really should. Somebody should try. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, California has um, yeah the most restrictive um, bypass provisions when it comes to somebody's criminal history. Um, it's unfair. It's awful. Um, but because there is no nexus required, I think that this is something where you should really, really, really try to push best interests, um, okay? Because I, I know in my experience, I've seen a lot of clients come in who have these really old um, criminal convictions and, you know, it, it's it's not who they are anymore and, you know, the, the bigger the gap between that conviction and where they are today, it really helps the lack of criminal history, the bond with their kid, it's all things that you really need um, to focus on. Um, another thing that you um, is generally best practice is asking for a certified uh, record of conviction. Remember, the burden is clear and convincing. Um, so make sure you hold the department to that standard. Oh, no, that's exactly what I was going to get to. The, the evidence code requires a certified copy of the conviction for the court to take you with a notice of the, the conviction. And a lot of times the department's just going to give you a flex and try and base their recommendation for that. Yeah, so I definitely ask for that whole department to their standard. Um, another thing to look out for is um, for juvenile convictions. Now, WIC 203 uh, generally doesn't allow um, con convictions from a juvenile court to be utilized for the purpose of this bypass. So if you have a juvenile conviction, um, make sure that you object to that being used for B12. Um, What's the evidence code section? It's uh, WIC uh, 203. Oh, it's in the WIC, not in the evidence code? Oh, the evidence code for right. the... Um, I'm Certified conviction. For something, 450... I think I... Yes, it is. 452. Yeah, 452. 452. Thank you. <laughs> so what's the effect where a client has been convicted of a felony, but that is later reduced to a misdemeanor? Does that have an effect on the felony? In what way? Oh, so they were re it was they were convicted, but then it was reduced. Mm -hmm. I think as long as they have um, 
if they committed a crime and were convicted of a crime that meets the elements of any of the crimes under 667.5, it counts. Because there is case law that says that even if your client committed a crime out of the state that qualified, that meets all the elements of one of the crimes listed in that penal code, they can still get bypassed even if the crime was a misdemeanor in another state. So focus on the elements of the crime. Okay, um, the next one um, is the waiver of services. Uh, this is an easy one. If your client wants to waive services, you um, go over the form with them, um, make sure that the court makes findings on the record, um, advise your clients of all the consequences of waiving unification services. And again, I always encourage people to not do this unless your client is present because um, it is a pretty big deal to waive reunification services and you want to make sure your client um, is fully aware of everything that's happening. Um, the next one is the abduction of a child. Now, this one has um, one published case, yay. Um, basically, if you take your child and don't tell anybody where the child is, um, and refuse to return the child, then you could qualify under this bypass provision. Uh, the one case that was published about it, um, NRA AA, um, basically says you can't be bypassed under this provision if the child was um, released to your custody. Um, now, one thing to note about that case is that they specifically mentioned that there was no court order that the mother um, not leave California. Now, that might present a bit of a hiccup for us because I know a lot of the judges give the warnings to not leave the seven Southern California counties. Um, but again, generally, um, in that case, she was still in contact with the social workers. A lot of times when our clients leave with their children, they tell the social worker where they're going. They don't necessarily have permission, but it's not like they just up and disappear. So you can use that to distinguish your cases as well. Um, and then generally encourage your clients to, to not uh, steal their kids when they're not pulled out in their hands. <laughs> so is this release or placed? Uh, it was placed, actually. Yeah. Okay. So she, it was a home of parent mother order. Um, and then she, in that case, she had left the state. Um, she didn't have any permission, but she had been in frequent contact with the social worker. So what do you think would have happened if it had been pre-jurist? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I think, so th in that case it was unique because they bypassed her for um, a different kid, um, and then they just, I think pre-juris, I think it would still apply. I think she's still, technically the children are still released to your care. I think this is mostly for um, parents that don't, aren't allowed to be, um, have their kids at home with them, basically. You know, if you if you take a kid during a visit, if your kid is suitably placed somewhere, then don't steal your kid, basically. And what about pre-detention? Pre-detention? Um, I don't know necessarily um, how they would feel about that. I mean, I think if the kid eventually is given back pre-detention, I, I think everything's a little bit more murky mm -hmm. in that, but if you try to flee with your kid, it doesn't look good. If you, um, if the kid isn't formally removed from you, um, it doesn't look good, but I think we've all had a lot of those cases where the, the parent learns that the department's going to file and then yeah. they're gone. Um, Some would call that wise. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but um, I, I rarely see this bypass provision used because that happens all the time. Right. So I think my opinion on how I read this and how I read the case, the one case that, that they have about it, is that they really intend it for parents who, um, during while their case is going, like they, they just run away with the kid during a visit or something like that, and they actually um, are gone for a long amount of time, and it's so egregious and it's so dangerous to the kid that they feel the need to bypass. Um, that's the way I read it, um, and it's so rarely used that I think that is, you know, uh, the purpose of it because it's it happens so much that parents sleep with their kids. 
Okay, uh, B16 is for um, registered sex offenders. So if your client is required to register as a sex offender, then um, they can be bypassed. Um, fun fact, there is a typo in this um, statute, and the uh, code that they reference doesn't actually exist. Um, but uh, regardless, it still applies. Um, if your client is a sex offender required to register, um, warn them that they can be bypassed. And you will usually get a hint of this because, again, if you have a client that's a sex offender, you usually have a de-allegation. Um, does it matter, because I know there's like three levels of being a sex offender, because sometimes you can be labeled a sex offender if you, like, were drunk and peed in a park at night, so, like, no, if, if you're required to register um, as a sex offender, then, then you fall under this bypass provision. But that's something that I would utilize um, for the best interest exception. Because I, I think when you have cases like that, I know you can be required to register for pretty minor things. Um, I would bring that to the court's attention because I think that does show best interest. I think it's really critical that when you have a client who has to register, get from them usually the conditions of their registry. It's through the usually the probation department because there are cases where people, there's different types of people. Some cannot be around children, any child, ever. There are other people who successfully come out of prison, go through their programs, and they can be around their own children. And so then you have to be able to distinguish that because there are some people who absolutely, the department is going to notice you and you're going to be able to show the court that there's no preclusion as to their own child. So be aware that there's different degrees. In addition, you know, you can all remember just because the department is noticing doesn't mean we don't win. Doesn't mean we don't get these children back to our clients. We call a parent even. So, you know, we have experts who can go and testify that this person is not a risk. So regardless of the registry, don't let this frighten you, but it's very, very important that you make sure your client gets to you the conditions of the registry. Because as I said, there are some people who have to register, but they can have children, and this conclusion should not take effect. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it is important to know, because a lot of times, yes, these are combined with D allegations, and when, the, when that's all they have, just the person required to register as a sex offender, a lot of times those allegations are dismissed anyway. So if that happens, and I think you have an even stronger case um, for getting the best interest provision granted here, because uh, yeah, a lot of the times it's, that's not the reason the case came in, they just happen to have this and the department finds out about it. So push really hard um, for the best interest exception for these cases. Okay, uh, this is the newest bypass provision um, in effect as of January 2017. Um, so there is no case law about this, but um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, a parent that has participated in or permitted the sexual exploitation um, of their child can be bypassed. Um, so this is sexual exploitation, sex trafficking. Um, it's a little different than the B6 because it's broader. Um, it's not just sexual abuse, it's you know selling or distributing pictures, videos of your child um, participating in sex acts. Um, I, I've never seen this used, of course, because it's so new, but if you have this come up, I encourage you to look at um, the, the penal code sections that um, are listed. Okay, so the best interest exception, 361.5 C2, it's your kind of get out of jail free card. Uh, it's a situation in which it applies only to, to um, basically everything but B1, B2, and B5. B5 because it has its own reasoning and its own exception that applies. And B1 and B2 because it's kind of pointless to give services to someone who's not around or to someone who would not be able to benefit from those services. It is our burden. And the, I actually really like this line from In Re Ethan N that kind of kind of tries to define what the best interest is. It's the concept of a child's best interest is an elusive guideline that belies rigid definition. The purpose is to maximize a child's opportunity to develop into a well-adjusted adult. That being said, a lot of the appellate courts have have not found the best interest exists. Um, in particular, they read hate people who have 
kill the child. Um, <laughs> more often than not, I've seen those cases where they actually get overturned. They overturn the, uh, the trial court and say, actually, that's not in the child's best interest because that person killed the child. Um, and also understand, though, the, the appellate court is looking for an abuse of discretion. So you should really go hard on this, on this part. Uh, because if you could get the trial court to agree that it is in the child's best interest, it's going to be harder for the appellate court to overturn that decision. Unfortunately, again, do not kill a child. They do not <laughs> like that. Some of the factors to be considered, um, it was in referenced in In Ray GL, it was a case that a mother got services after being after a prior bypass. Again, it's a totality of the circumstances situation. Um, the minor's desires, the minor's bond between the parents, whether or not the parents are, are participating in services, whether or not they've ameliorated some of their concerns from before. So it really is, you look at the whole picture to see whether or not this is in the child's best interest. Um, I hear this a lot in court, uh, having practice, you get to hear a lot of people say, well, the other parent's getting services, so my client should get services too, it's in the child's best interest. Two people getting services is better than one. Um, in the dicta of In Re Madison S, that did not fly. Basically, they said, we're statutorily required to give the other person services just because we're statutorily required to. Maybe the court didn't want to give her services, but it was required to do so. You don't get to say it's in the child's best interest because you're also, uh, because you don't get services and the other person is. So just be careful with that. However, if you do get the child court to agree with you, then so be it. Okay, so the last one um, is 361.5e, which I think everyone here has seen a ton of times. Um, now this one is a little bit different than the B provisions because uh, the standard is, is different. It's not, um, it, it, it's, it's um, not just like they're not gonna get reunification services, but rather they have to get reunification services unless it can be shown by clear and convincing evidence that the services would be detrimental to the child. Okay, so if you have an incarcerated client, make sure you look at um, this list of things that the court can consider. Again, the length of the sentence is only one, one factor, okay? There are a number of other factors that you should bring up to the court, okay? The likelihood of the parents' release, the age, the bonding, everything like that. Um, so the length of incarceration is something that we do tend to focus on a lot. Um, so here are some just uh, facts for you. The parent doesn't necessarily need to be convicted for a crime. Now, um, that is something that, in my experience, um, I haven't had an issue with. If the parent's just incarcerated or awaiting charges, um, usually try to get dispo going as soon as possible because the court doesn't know how long they're going to be there. So nobody really tries to bypass for that. Um, this case says that you don't necessarily have to be convicted, um, but if somebody brings this up, I would really try to distinguish this case from the case that you have, because this case has terrible facts. Um, in that case, the, the father was actually awaiting charges on murder because he murdered the other parent. Um, so that is something that they, they considered a little bit more than the length of the sentence um, in itself. So again, uh, that is something that you want to read um, in case you have that situation come up and you want to distinguish your case so you can get FR for your parents. Um, now there is um, a bit of a variety in terms of what the Court of Appeal has found to be too long. Now there's a case where 17 months necessarily wasn't um, too long. So just remember, even if your client is going to be incarcerated for over a year, they're technically entitled to up to 24 months of reunification services. So if this is um, a, a mom that had custody of her kids all their life and she's um, very bonded to them, but she's going to be in custody for, say, 17 months, that shouldn't be the end of the discussion. Even though she's only entitled to 6 or 12 months reunification, that's not the maximum that she can receive. So really push that to the court and push the bond to the court. Um, but there is also situations where one year may be too long. Um, and you'll find that in cases where the parent um, doesn't have a relationship with their kid. It's a baby that um, they have um, never met um, or you know, they've only seen a handful of times and they're going to be there for about a year. They don't really know of any services at their place of incarceration. There isn't really anything offered. Um, the court can bypass for that. Um, so it is important to kind of uh, take the lead on this, even though we don't necessarily have the burden. 
um, to, to explore what is available at your um, client's place of incarceration. Encourage them um, and ask them about their bond. Um, encourage them to try to get family members to arrange visitation at their place of incarceration if you can create it. So. Um, again, some practice pointers. Um, remember, before you get this bypass revision, always see if you can get a home of parent order. Um, you know, all is not lost when you have an incarcerated client. Ask them if they have any family members that are willing to um, take in their kid. Um, see if you can get it, make an appropriate plan. Any family members willing to care for their kid without funding. Um, so that is something you can always look into. Um, they can also be bypassed for other provisions that we talked about. So E1 usually isn't alone. Um, sometimes they qualify under the violent felony provision. Sometimes they qualify under the sex offender provision. Um, so again, just be aware of all the provisions that could possibly apply um, to your client and then advise them accordingly and plan your argument um, and testimony or anything like that accordingly. Um, and be prepared to win. Because again, the burden is different here. You have, they have to show by clear and convincing evidence that it would be detrimental to the child. So this is something that um, everyone should be um, confident about because again, the, the burden of proof is in our favor. Um, so you know, if you have a client that's gonna be in custody for a long time, then <coughs> look into their place of incarceration, see what programs are offered, look into their bond, ask them to testify as to their bond, as to when they're gonna be released, everything like that because this is, it should be hard for them to show detriment to the child. Just because a client is incarcerated doesn't mean they shouldn't be allowed to um, reunify with their child. Yeah. Um, so that's it. Any questions? No questions? We have three minutes for questions. Now. <laughs> Four ten. Four ten. Four ten.